2035, 40 cities will control the global GDP. A handful of tech-savvy cities will be among those 40 cities. Philadelphia is going through a tech revolution of its own. In the heart of that tech revolution are companies like Comcast, but there are also smaller companies like Jarvis and Nerdstream, the founder of which is John Fazio. I've invited John for a quick drink at Tradici, so let's go. I was telling my um, uh, son that I'm going to see you today. Yeah. You know, like most of the other 11-year-old kids, he's addicted to video games. Yeah. So part of me hates you, obviously, because you're yeah. you know, the star in the video game business. But also as an investor and, and counsel and other things that, you know, our relationship. I'm just so impressed with what Nerd Street is doing. How's it going? It's going great. You know, I appreciate that. Uh, we've done something really incredible. We saw this vision 12 years ago. We yeah. started talking about this. So, so to see it come to fruition is just empowering. So how big is it now? Uh, with 22 employees. Uh, we're operating in six different cities. We have a venue here in Philadelphia, a venue in Denver, and two mobile trucks uh, in Huntington Beach in Philadelphia that deploy all across the country. Yeah, and well, what's the plan next next five years? What's going on? Some of that's a secret. You yeah. Know? You know, we're not telling uh, all the secrets, but yeah, we're going to continue expanding, building out these venues. You know, the, the analogy here is yeah. ice hockey just became the most popular sport in the world, and there's no ice rinks to play at. Right. You know, so esports is popular. Everybody wants to play, but where do you do it? Where do you compete? We're building those facilities. So I've heard that, you know, you're one of the, you know, the hottest trends, and obviously one of the hottest tech companies in Philly, but in esports area, you are, you're the guy now. How big is esports, and like, what's your space in that overall market? You know, it's 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 big. You know, the reality here is uh, one of the stats, and you know, you can fact check me on this, but I think it's about 75 percent of nine to 16 year olds play traditional sports, or 65 percent, 99.9 percent play video games. Right. So it's a you know, it's a very far spread demographic. There are a lot of video game players, but esports is only a small fraction of them who think of themselves as competitors. You know, imagine the kid who plays pack up basketball with his friends never thought to join a league. Right. We are are working on converting that customer who's a gamer to say, wait, I can compete. You know, I play Fortnite at home with my friends. I could show up at a tournament and potentially get recruited for college or meet and join a team and become a part of an organization. And we've really focused on the niche of providing that amateur opportunity ecosystem. Because uh, right now, all the attention is focused at these big pro teams that are on TV and right. they're celebrities. But if you're, you know, Joe from Bucks County and you watch the Philadelphia Fusion Overwatch team in LA and you want to be a competitor, where do you go? Yeah. We want to lay that infrastructure. So how big is the industry? So right uh, now, uh, Goldman Sachs, I, th I believe they just estimated it at about 500 million, and they es estimate 1.5 billion in the next three years. However, I think that calculation is a little bit skewed because you forget that the actual game publishers themselves are esports. If you're Overwatch right. selling 30 million copies or whatever it is that they're selling. It is inherently a competitive esport game. I don't believe that Goldman counts those numbers and that that's a video game revenue. Um, so what I see right now is an industry of video games that has absolutely, you know, it passed Hollywood in the 90s. It's the biggest media industry right now, and esports is a you know, few percent of that market. Uh, so to expand the esports market out and to make more gamers think of themselves as competitors, this market is going to 100x. <laughs> Why do you call it Nerd Street? We stumbled into a really cool building space 12 years ago. Uh, it was on North 3rd. I was running my software engineering business, Jarvis, there. We threw a party one night to play video games. Our designer looked out the window and said, N3RD looks like nerd. Let's call this Nerd Street Gamers. We're the Nerd Street Gamers. I would always pronounce it North Third Street. Some people do. It's like our dog whistle. We know yeah. if you're a nerd. Yeah. If you if you pick up on it, yeah, if you say yeah. N3RD, you're, you're yeah, old. I, clearly, I'm not. I'm not a techie. What do you think about the Philly tech scene? Is it vibrant in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, you know, I owe my success to the Philly tech scene. I came up here. You know, I built a software company here. Took advantage of talent from local universities. Uh, you know, had contracts with the city, with the state, with the, our local Fortune 500 companies. Um, so I'm a big believer in Philly tech. Philadelphia has a unique brand. We've always had a unique brand. We have that 
uh, you know, you know where you stand. We're going to tell you where, you know, the, the throwing snowballs at Santa Claus, booing George Bush, that's our attitude. Philly Tech represents that in a lot of ways. I think it's like authentic grassroots. We respect the bootstrapper more than we respect the venture capitalists. When people come in and say, how do we get more like Silicon Valley, Philly people say, we don't want to be Philadelphia. You know, we don't want to be Silicon Valley. We are Philadelphia. We're going to do things our way. It's good to hear that because what Dell was to Austin, I've always prayed that Comcast will be to Philadelphia. Yeah. And my prayer was not that we only have Dell right. coming out of Austin. It's the ecosystem it's not, they it's the create ecosystem from the investments. Yeah. What's, your, what's your thought about the future of Philadelphia tech scene? Um, I don't think it's going to be anything like Silicon Valley. I hope nobody says that, and I hope that everybody gets that out of their head. Uh, you know, I think that there's some cities like Austin, like Philadelphia, like Boston, um, like Cleveland, uh, that have very unique demographics that shouldn't try to change. They should just embrace who they are. Um, I think that what I would love to see for Philly, and this is totally personally driven, not necessarily a prediction, is to see us embrace that bootstrap culture. You know, whether we like it or not, we don't have the Silicon Valley capital access that they do out there in San Francisco, but we do have more talent than most cities do. We have a higher density of talent from University of Pennsylvania, from Drexel, from Temple, from LaSalle, from Villanova, all right here and concentrated. That intelligence is what I would love to see us focus on without the need for capital. So how can you start your business without, you know, how can you live off future revenues? How can you borrow money to get started? How can you hustle without on capital, You don't think that capital is a necessary ingredient in we order to- We built Jarvis with no capital up front. We had no money, Chris But you were I. also brilliant. But not everybody can do that. You need capital to get started, right? Most of the other arenas that you talk about- Telling Silicon the Valley success story that we had bootstrapping is the first step. More people hear about it, more people know it's a viable option. I think that it's a disservice to progress when, when you want to start a business and you have a good idea, your first thought is go get money. Mm -hmm. I think your first thought should be how do I execute the primary business function. Sometimes that requires money. Oftentimes you can get pretty close without money. Are you, on balance, an optimist or pessimistic about our future? I'm an optimist, like a, a, an eternal. Even with all the climate change uh, yeah. concerns, uh, you know, uh, uh, wealth inequality concerns, even the, all of the things that you're seeing right now, that is the general chatter among the masses, you still believe that the future is bright? Even if I felt that what the masses are saying now is accurate, I would still have the optimism. Yes, what, I, I tend towards the good. What fuels that optimism? Tell me why. Um, historical data. We've made it this far. We've made it through mass genocide, through war. We've lowered crime rate. We've lowered homelessness. We've increased health care. Um, as a society, we've done that over a 10,000 year period. Um, that historical data is you know, the, all the abstracted projection I need to look forward and say we're going to keep doing that. But because of people like you, technologists and all these great uh, minds, we may be in an environment where it's a winner-take-all environment, where a handful of companies who have the massive data mm -hmm. will harness the new, narrow, artificial intelligence and singularity world, and they will decide, and they will have autonomous uh, entities replace all of the jobs, taking away our sense of purpose and sense of community, further dividing the disparity of wealth. I'm not being pessimistic. I'm asking, as, as a curious person who doesn't know enough, you still feel that in the world that we can make it when the robots and artificial intelligence yeah. and cloud computing is going to take over. I mean, they can do things that I can never imagine doing. Yeah, I think that it'll be like this. You know, it'll be like this, this, this funnel where uh, you're right. We're shaving off. We're we're kind of amalgamating and it's centralizing. But at a certain kind of critical tipping point, a technology is far too powerful, and b we are surrounded by far too many resources, especially in the solar system outside this planet, for us to not eventually reach that post-scarcity vision. So to get there will be rough. To get there, we'll see, you know, income in inequality is going to get much, much worse over the next decade. As I long as agree. we continue to increase liquidity the way that we have, as long as we continue to, you know, forward qualitative easing from our governments only towards that top part economic participants and never towards the bottom, inequality is going to get much worse. However, I think that technology is the long-term answer for that because if we can hit the tipping point of self-sustaining energy, feeding technology, getting resources that are abundant, nobody should be wanting. And that's the vision. That's the yeah, but, but then the problem is, that may be true. Our material needs may be 
commoditized and nobody should be wanting, but our sense of purpose if we're replaced by Autobots. I think it's a really big shame that, that I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist. I believe in the power of capitalism. I think that it's brought more people you're out of poverty. You're a dreamer and a capitalist. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a dreaming capitalist. Yeah. Um, however, I think one of the worst and most, you know, shameful parts of capitalism is the idea that you have to define your worth by your productivity. Your, you, by your creation of capital. You think, uh, you think humanity will become more creative yeah. because they will no longer have to be Absolutely. producing? They won't be stuck doing nine to five paralegal job when they could actually be painters being or cooks. Being humans. Being humans. Let and the robots whatever. be the so robots. You're, so you're painting a much more of a, a rosy picture than I uh, normally think about. Well, I'm being you know uh, uh, an optimist now, but I am pragmatic in the optimism. I think that a lot of what you just said, a lot of the pain is how you get there. So I was the kid who was the computer math nerd hanging out in math club and then going to soccer practice and I had these two groups of friends who just you could not get them to communicate I couldn't get the math club to hang out with my soccer team no matter what I did until 10th grade rolls around and this game called Unreal Tournament releases and all of a sudden we're all on our computers playing the same game together competing we're hanging out at the same house and my worlds have collided and in a lot of ways I think that you know is symbolic of what we did here you know I, I stumbled into a skill set. I had priv a privileged upbringing, two parents who put me in a good education, gave me a good upbringing, and a father who pushed me towards business. You know, when he saw me come home as a ninth, you know, a nine-year-old with a adeptness for technology, he printed out trifold brochures that said, I'll help fix your computer, and took them around the neighborhood so that, you know, I could kickstart myself as a business person. And by the time I was in high school, How I was... How old were you at this point? I, my, I started selling those computer repair services around 12. You were 12 year old, yeah. your father invests in you, and you start, what, what kind of loot were you making at that? At I point? think by, by time by bar mitzvah years came around at 13, I was, you know, making 10, 15,000 a year. 10, 15,000 yeah. a year, Jesus. Um, and that led you to, is that, is that the beginning of the fascination with tech and? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, so again, privileged upbringing in a, in a really productive home life, you know, right. so my father saw that I was really into this and I was obsessing over it. And By the way, we're getting some good food up here. Yeah, I know, I know you probably really eat healthy, but I'm, I'm not like you. That, you wanted that? No, that's good. Good to um, hear that. So they, uh, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he sees that I'm adept, and he brings me home computers from his work to take apart right. and do whatever I want to. You know, uh, he, he bought me computer manuals so that I could study networking and learn about how the systems tied together. Right, right. Um, one at a time. You know, he kind of just pushed me in that direction. Is your dad a role model in terms of business then, or, or personal, Absolutely, obviously, but yeah. also? I mean, you, you know that unfortunately I lost yeah, him yeah. about six months ago, and you know he was my best friend, my personal right. mentor, um, and all that I can say is that he left a very big imprint you know I, I owe everything to him I know that uh, I people ask me all the time when we have conversations like this you know what do you think differentiates you from other people and I really have one answer in that I recognize my privilege and he gave that to me you know I think too many people in our society are privileged and don't recognize it and they take it for granted and it's not so you know what's interesting you know when we, when we first met we were you had this really exciting company Jarvis in my opinion by the way um, Alfano and those guys that, who were running it, probably the smartest tech company in the city, a huge fan. And then you start in Art Street. But I remember when we first met, you were talking about space exploration and all that, and then you started doing this. Um, you still have that dream? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, tell me a little bit about that. Um. I read sci-fi when I was a kid. You know, so my family was big readers. We all read books. You know, I remember being five years old reading Hardy Boys. You know, like cause we got into it, and I got a hold of Isaac Asimov's The Foundation. And if you're not familiar with the story, it's a projected, you know, 10,000 year timeline and a historian who understands the trends of society, massaging them to be more productive and evolve. And I fell in love with the idea of us colonizing the space around us. You know, I think it's a natural genetic trait to explore, to move, to go across that ocean. Yeah, but to most figure people colonize you know, Newark or go, want to go to California. But you were thinking space that's now, the next Jupiter. Step. Yeah, that's the next step. So but how old were you when you thinking this way? I was nine. I was, so I was nine years old when I, when I came home. Were you the I, only one or did you have a bunch of other kids? Because uh, I didn't think like this, right? I'm, I'm, I never saw Star Wars or anything else. So I had no fascination with the outer limits of just where I was living, my northeast Philadelphia was my space. Yeah. So you were thinking already, did you have other kids or were you the only no, one thinking I was, this? I was all alone until I met Alfano when I was 19. You know, it wasn't until I met him that I heard anybody talk like I 
thought, you know, and what I saw was like an inevitable we need to leave this planet. Like, okay, we can be here for 100 years, we can be here for 500, but there is some timeline where we cannot be here anymore and to not think forward like that is just so unfathomable. Are, are there, is there anybody in the corporate world that you go, oh, he, this person, she or he, are, are doing these things I want to yeah, emulate? Elon, Elon, Elon Musk, Jeff so Bezos, yeah. uh, you know, incredibly inspir inspired so let's, by let's what they do. let's say Elon and Jeff are successful in what they're doing. Yeah. What's your role? How, how are you helping with space exploration? You know, so one of the things that Elon Musk did was he lowered the cost of space travel significantly to a fraction of its past costs. So right. now, for somebody to come in and build, say, an infrastructure business in orbit, you know, mm -hmm. a business that creates orbital manufacturing facilities or asteroid mining companies, well, the cost of doing that, the cost of starting that business just got margin, you know, just came down right. to a fraction of what it was thanks to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. So in some ways, they're the inventors of the internet that will pave the way for the social networks, for the YouTubes, for the Netflixes of space, and they've laid that groundwork. So they've greased my pipeline. They've made it easier to do that, and everything that I've kind of built and focused on investing in and operating has been with the mindset of how can I get the capital, the resources, and the influence to eventually go down that path. So it's interesting. So I look at the industry as both the discovery phase, yeah. which you need the smartest people Lot of, lots of money, government intervention, otherwise private capital, to have the best scientists discovering something, right? So invention of electricity was the discovery phase. Right. After the invention, then you don't need as many smart scientists on the implementation, taking the electricity to household appliances and house, et cetera. What you just described sounded like Elon and Jeff has already done the discovery, now you're doing the implementation. Are you saying that you're in the discovery or are you in the impl implementation? A little of both. And so they've done the discovery on travel. You know, I do think that we're going, we're on the brink of new travel uh, paradigms. You know, we're still strapping people to rockets and shooting them into space. That's literally what we're doing. Right. Uh, I do think we'll find that new discovery, that new technology that lowers it. But right now, they've really, you know, changed the name of the, the game. Now the discovery becomes, you know, there's asteroids floating within you know reach that we've already gone further and those asteroids hold more minerals than we have on the entire planet and we're all talking about resource issues here um, so the discovery so you're, phase you're saying the minerals that we need we can actually mine yeah I mean so right now getting into space the hard part is leaving our atmosphere it's taking right. weight and getting up out of the atmosphere but once you're out of the atmosphere if you are collecting resources right. there's a fraction of the energy required to build structures to mine ore to produce chemicals right. and the other thing is is that without the gravitational limitations, if you're building something in space, you have no volume constrictions. You could build a ship the size of Philadelphia right. if you start there. Um, and I think we're, we're really close to that shift. I think we're 10, 15 that, years would away. Happen, would that happen in our lifetime, yeah. you think? Yeah, I think, we're 10 really? to, I think we're 10 to 15 years away from the, the real first flag in colonizing space. Uh, I 10 to 15 years. So I've been, um, I've been serving as John the Baptist for the narrow AI you know, at, mm. at least to the analog world of my industry, law, law firms and others, making the argument that the invention of electricity has already happened, right? So the, so the neural network, narrow AI has now developed, that's the invention of electricity, all the, which is heavily dependent on data, algorithms, and government right. policy. Uh, the generation of fossil fuels and electric plant and the, and the roads, right? So in that, that metaphor. That's why you have loan officers who will not, will not be working in five years because right. enough data for, for a computer to tell whether or not John Fazio uh, is credit worthy, right. paralegals, uh, small time accounting stuff, anything that is data, cancer research, yeah. you, you name it, if it's data it's We just got a line of credit without talking to a person. Right. Yeah. But when I talk to my colleagues and I say in the next five years, 40 to 50 percent of the jobs will just be gone, uh, they're incredulous. Yeah. One, not only uh, do they not believe it, they believe that this is at least 20, 30, 40 years away. Right. And you're talking about something even more, space exploration mm -hmm. will be five to 10 years. Yeah. Absolutely, I think that within the next 10 to 15 and I'm, years. I, I feel we'll like I'm, I'm, I'm one of my colleagues saying there's no way. Yeah, five well, I think, oh, I think in the next five years we'll start to see the first planting uh, moon bases, Mars. Um, we'll start to see in more, five years. more human travel. Do you see in five years uh, autonomous cars, uh, a majority of autonomous cars on, on, no. on the roads? No. Why not? So wh why that, which seems to be even far-reaching goal, and 
and not autonomous cars, which right now... It's the same reason that we invented the cell phone, but don't even have, you know, uh, mass plumbing in major societies in the, in the world. You know, uh, the, the progress of society and humanity is pocketed. It's, you know, locked away to the privileged and the rich in some ways and not for the other people. So that, I think that's the nature of evolution and advancement. Um, no, I don't think that's the trend... Interesting. I don't think the trends are there for uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicles to hit majority in the next five years, but I do think in the next five years we're going to hear about the first robotic mining a a asteroid success story. We're going to hear about the first robotic uh, plantation on the moon. We're going to hear about people getting sent to Mars. That's very close. My goal is 10 to 15 years to be in a place where I can take advantage of the trends, the cost efficiencies that have been created, and hopefully have created enough of a career and asset portfolio for myself to leverage building the company that I'd like to build. So let's go back to nursery for a second. Yeah. Because, so for me as a dad, uh, my 11-year-old who I had to wean off, and I'm in the process because right now we're on a, uh, on a pause moment where he was playing like 12, 13 yeah. hours a day. Yeah and I've taken it out of his hands. But you see opportunities yeah. uh, within the video game industry, not only as a capitalist, but for society. Make that case. Yeah, I mean, uh, number one, the first thing I'll never do is discount a parent's right to obedience and, you know, controlling their children's future. That's why you're a parent. That's what you do. Well, so, you, you don't know my son. There is no obedience so, and there is no controlling the future. He decides. Well, I will never that, uh, tell a parent that they're wrong, you know, about yeah. how they decide to, that, you right. know, that is your prerogative. However, uh, I think that it's important to look at the bigger picture and some of the history. You know, you and I had this conversation a few weeks ago. Um, I just heard this on NPR of all places that there was a time in the 1870s when the trains and the railroads first hit <laughs> that parents <laughs> created blacked out cabins because right. they were afraid that the information passing on the train window so fast would fry the brains <laughs> of their kids, right? right? And then right. in the, you know, I think it was the 30s or the 40s, there was a chess fever and parents were afraid their kids were too addicted to chess and their brains were melting. And now now, imagine how happy you'd be if your kid was playing chess for 12 hours a day. You wouldn't be saying the same thing as you are with video games. I, I don't so with that said, hmm. there's, need, there's a necessity for balance. Right. The difference here with video games in this day and age is that while your kid it may be you know, showing addictive personality issues that you want to address and balance issues for sure, he's also building a skill set that our modern day economy requires. He's sitting on a you know, VoIP, talking to people across the country, learning how to integrate, yeah. learning how to compete. And those are skills that I think are ever more important hit. I was lot. talking to one of your buddies, one of your colleagues, and he said, uh, ask John about how you met Brianna. He'll tell you uh, everything about John. What's the story? He didn't tell me. I, I was so damn curious. I said, tell me the story. And he just went and said, ask John. He'll tell you, and he'll tell you everything about John, apparently. I came to... So this story better be great, by the way, because the setup is... I don't know if it's that good, but it, it should be good. So day one, school day one, uh, September, I see this girl walking across the quad, and I said to my roommate at the time, who was with me for, you know, in the, dorm, the soccer dorms, I said, you see that girl? She's so beautiful. And he said, oh, I know who she is. She's dating somebody. And I said, that's my wife. Pause. I think if I heard correctly, you're sitting with your buddy, yeah. some random lady who you don't know, yeah. you've never met her before, met first her. time you see somebody, yeah. how far is she at this point? 60 yards. 60 <laughs> it wasn't yards. even close. Yeah. Okay, so, so 60 she yards just, away, you just see a form me. walking by. She's walking towards me, and as she's walking towards me, she kind of turns off to and go you, through these you tennis courts. And you apparently said to your wife that that's my wife. What was about that form? Was it just your premonition? I'm not one for fate or premonition, or, but, you know, I believe in pattern recognition. Is she that beautiful? She really is. At our wedding, my father gave a speech, and he said, in, in John's whole life, he spends all of his time breaking outside the boxes. You put a box there, he says, I don't care what I have to do here, I'm going to figure out how to break out. But when Brianna puts a box in, he says, how can I stay within that box? Do you see world of business as a cutthroat Darwinism? Of you have to have that edge? No. Um, no, Does I, it have I, to have that? no I, I think it's easier, you know, so maybe that's the lazy way. I like to have the sharp edge because it's easier than being nice to everybody, which is incredibly difficult. But no, I meet people who I look at them and I'm just like, how did you what make it this you, how far? How would your employees career? describe you? Maybe a little cutthroat. Uh, cutthroat? Kurt. Uh, Kurt? I can be very curt. Um, uh, What's is that intentional or is that just your default personality? De default, you know, yeah. business at the speed of thought. How quickly can How I transmit information? How would your investors information? describe you? Um, passionate, diligent. You know, I think that I've, you know, obviously curated a very good image with them. Um, but I think they see me as a lot more um, maybe physically, I don't know the word. I think my employees would call me a recluse. 
you know, I, 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 well, you I, don't, you don't like press. I've noticed that yeah. you don't like to be out there. Um, so I do agree that you're recluse, but I, I wouldn't call you cutthroat. Why did you say cutthroat? You, um, so your employees will call you cutthroat. I think you are sure of yourself. You know what you want and you blunt. You say what you mean, mean what you say. That's not cutthroat to me. There doesn't seem to be a negative edge that to you. It might be a generational thing. Generational you know, thing? Yeah, I think that the, well, you know, the, yeah, the, the younger generation, yeah, despite your looks, uh, the younger generation, uh, you know, when they hear that I have to fire somebody who's a friend, right. they oh, call well, that I cutthroat, see. you know? I and see, I see, I And I don't care. It's a business. You know, we're not a family. We're here to make money and return right. to our investors. If you're not doing that, I can still be your friend and you can't be a part of the company anymore. But, but that's mean what you say what you mean, mean what you say culture. Right, so uh, as opposed to being passive aggressive, you're not passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. You've never been passive aggressive. No, I'm not capable of it. I'm not capable right. of not confronting head on. Do you have anybody in your team who can be on the EQ side? If the new generation, your peers, the millennial generation, if they want more of the uh, of that passive aggressive style, yeah, do you have somebody who does that for yeah, you? Yeah, that's my HR uh, director, HR. and he's you know great. Uh, Pete Powell came from the Comcast side and was just like a really passionate and empathetic person. Well, we were talking about venture partner, my, my venture partner Rudy Carson. He talks about how when he was learning how to swim, he lived in Africa, he swam in the ocean. That's where, that was his swimming pool. Sharky. Swimming pool, right. And he would try to swing, he would crash into the waves, get exhausted, the ocean would throw him back, you know, teach him a, a humble lesson. And then one day he just realized, instead of crashing into the waves, why not just ride the waves? But that turned into sort of a, a life lesson in business, politics, yeah. press, you know, personal, etc. But I get the sense that for you, a lot of your life experiences, whether it is soccer, being in the arena, and feeling that sense of air going out of your lungs, yeah. and then feeling nervous, and then saying, no, wait a minute, they're all here to watch me. Right. That level of confidence that you've de developed. Jarvis becoming a, a wonderful success story in Philadelphia, with, I think, the, uh, rightfully, the Philadelphia ecosystem embracing it, cheering you guys on, and yeah. then you realizing, wait a minute, they're all here to watch us. Right launching Nerd Street, launching the next stuff. You know, your success and the dreams that you had as a nine-year-old kid funded by your dad with 15,000 you know, annual income, your success in the future, whether it's space exploration, Nerd Street, and digital gaming, you name it, is Philly's success. I think if we had 30 of John Fazio's and Chris Alfano's and Nerd Street and Jarvis, future is bright. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we cure poverty. It doesn't mean that uh, you know we can be blindly optimistic. But we know that we have a shot. No different than some of the other great cities that you see in the country. Um, you know, I'm happy to be that kind of role model, and that's you know a, a responsibility I'd be proud to take on. But there are more than just me. There's other really good opportunities to look at those success. The uh, you know Robert Moore and R RJ Metrics and what he's been able to do now three times. And there's all these really good success stories in Philly. And I think it's just really important that we tell those stories to the next generations. Yeah. You know, and not just the affluent middle class kids surrounding Philadelphia. You know, the, the kids who are in the urban schools that surround us right now uh, who can't even afford to live in the same neighborhood they're going to school in. Let's tell them the success stories. Let's highlight that. You know, I've always been an eternal optimist, pragmatist as well as an optimist. And then over the past few years, I've become much more negative. That's what happens. Because, it's called yeah, getting old. I'm, well, yeah, it's getting old. But, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm blessed to have young people like you around in my life. And, and this conversation fires you up because it's not just dreaming and looking at the stars and saying, you know, imagine the world like this, but you're actually doing it. You wake up every morning, nine to five, you have your spreadsheets, and thank God for Brianna, you know, yeah, who thank God for forces Brianna. you to dream and imagine a future that none of us can see yet, but you can see. Pretty cool, man. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for launch. We won't give up.